talking about so that we will understand. Brother Eric was here last week and the week before, so he'll probably understand a little better. But we were talking about King Solomon. King Solomon, because a, a lot of times I've, I've said before, when you open up the Bible and you grab the middle of a scripture, it doesn't always make sense unless you know kind of what we're talking about. So I want to kind of, uh, you know, if I was just to read this and you were in the, the class last week, you'd understand kind of what we're picking up. But if you weren't, it wouldn't make any sense. So I want to kind of give a background of where we were last week. Last week we talked about King Solomon. And our lesson was the downfall of King Solomon. And most of y'all know King Solomon was a very uh, wealthy, well-known king. Uh, <clears throat> he had a lot of wives we learned about last week. 700 wives, 300 concubines. And uh, he started out well. King Solomon started out being a, a, a you know, well king. He started out, the Lord had promised him that he, you know, he started out a very humble man. Uh, the Lord told him because of his humbleness, all he wanted was knowledge and wisdom to lead Israel. And so the Lord was moved by his humbleness and he said, okay, because you didn't ask for anything else, he said, I'm going to bless you abundantly with, treasure, with wealth and, and things because of that. And with a long life. And so because of that, he blessed him. Well, he said, as long as you serve me and you, uh, you know, continue to do for me and, and, and lead Israel uh, my, towards the Lord and be a godly king. Well, uh, King Solomon uh, started out well and he married 700 wives, which were not of God because they were strange women. Because the Bible says... But he loved strange women. Uh, those strange women we learned last week were women that were not of that country. They were strange women that said that they were uh, foolish women. We learned last week uh, they were women that were not of the same country. They were idol worshippers. And that in his kingdom, in his palace, he had actual rooms for each woman to worship their own God. They, own have, they have their own God that they worship, their own idol that they worship, and King Solomon allowed that, and that he became a very wicked king because of it, but that he had everything was lined with gold, he had everything he ever wanted, but that he was um, pinned for saying that everything was nothing, that it was all for naught, because he was not serving the Lord, and that the Lord had spoke to him and told him in our scripture last week, that everything was going to be given to one of his servants. Do you remember that, brother? Yes, ma'am. Everything was going to be given to one of his servants. And that because he was disobedient. So this is where we pick up. And our in our in our lesson this week is a disobedient prophet. So we're still getting into being disobedient here. But um, it's 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. And then we're going to skip to, to verse 4. Through 10. So we're picking up right where he told him that he was going to give everything to him right after we talked about King Solomon and about the strange women and the things that he did. And we dug out all that about King Solomon and the wickedness that he did. And so it says, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel and Jeroboam. And Jeroboam. Jeroboam is that servant. That the Lord said he would give. Oh, it's 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, and then 4 through 2. So, uh, verse 1 uh, said that uh, his name is Jeroboam. That's that servant that we're talking about. He stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thou saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah, by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priest of, of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and, and, men, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And it, and it came to pass when King jo Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in, Je in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him, and his hand, which had put forth against him, dried up. 
so that he could not pull it again to him. Now I'm going to explain all this to you in what we're, what we're doing. Because some of it's not really making a lot of sense on what we're saying here. So I'm going to get to it. Then we're going to, uh, verse 5. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. <clears throat> verse 6. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, and treat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for thee that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself. I will give thee a reward. That was verse seven. So we're going to. Go to verse 8. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go with thee, neither will I eat bread, nor drink water in this place. Verse 9. For so was it charged me by the Lord, by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink no water, nor, again, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. Verse 10. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now this is all telling the story of when the man of God came to Jeroboam. So we're going to explain. I'm going to explain all this. It's all going to make sense in a minute. People of God must be careful to obey him fully. Even those who have been God's spokesmen will suffer the consequences of disobedience. A lot of times, we, and, and me and Pastor, I was reading this lesson this week, and I went to Pastor about it, and I said, baby, I need your help. I don't understand something. You know, I went to, to my pastor. He's not just my husband. He's, you know, my man of God, too. He's my, I have to, I have to, <clears throat> to, to see him in different ways, and I can do that as, as his wife. He's not only my pastor, he's not only my, my, my love, he's also, uh, he can be my instructor. And I said, uh, he came home from work the other day, and I said, I've been studying the lesson. And I said, I get the story, I understand it, I got a hold of it. I said, I've studied it, I've read it, I've got it, but I don't understand something. And I went to him about this. And I said, how can you be disobedient, be called of God, and going for toward the, the call of God and be disobedient and God curse you that way. And he said, because disobedience is extremely important. And I got studying this out. It made me fearful. Amen. Fearful because yes. not, you know, people say, oh, God will look, again, you know, look away from that. Not always. Of course, we're talking about the Old Testament things may be a little different. So when I went to him and I was explaining to him how fearful I was about it and I was explaining to him and saying, how, it, tell me and help me understand and he was explaining to me the story. You know, sometimes it was his way of seeing the story and my way of seeing the story. This is, it helped me understand the whole big picture. Okay, so King Solomon, we learned about how he was a wicked king God came to him and told him, because you are a wicked king, I'm going to give everything you have to your servant. This servant we pick up in scripture was Jeroboam. Jeroboam, we studied last week about the division of Israel because of Solomon's transgression and idolatry. Jeroboam had been chosen by God to be the king over the ten northern tribes, while Jeroboam was a king of, of Jerusalem and Benjamin, the southern tribes. Jeroboam was instructed by God to obey his commandments and to walk in his ways. It's so funny to me how God has this time with them and they promise him but never come through with it. Now we start off good, but we don't end as good as we start off with. Right, come on. God promised Jeroboam that if he would walk in the right way, just like David had, David was his father, that God would establish his kingdom and give him a mighty reign. He would 
You would think that Jeroboam would be careful to follow God since he witnessed what had happened to Solomon because of sin, and yet Jeroboam turned quickly to idolatry. And this is how he did that. In the scripture text we read about Jeroboam, he, his quick spiritual demise. He no sooner became king when his position became his biggest concern. He had no desire to obey God, and he did not administer godly reign in Israel. He feared that it, if his people went to the temple to Jerusalem to worship God, that their loyalty to him would waver their hearts and would turn back to God and would turn away from him. Therefore he built two golden calves and placed them in a convenient places in the city. Right in the convenient place before they got to Jerusalem because he said, these two, two calves will be convenient and it's just too far to get to, this, to, to worship. So just go here because it's a little closer. Go to these two little I built them, so they're okay. I'm your king. I built them. Right. So they're on. okay. So go to these two golden calves and worship these two golden calves, and you'll be all right. Now, when I say that, in my mind, I'm thinking way, 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 way past this. And I'm thinking of how last week we talked about false prophets. We talked about being ever so careful of listening to people and not studying it out in the Word. And I said, don't just listen to me and pastor, don't just listen to somebody else study it out in the Word. Amen. Because you won't stand before God with me and say, Sister Myers told me, you'll stand before God for yourself. I will stand before God for myself. I will also stand before God for teaching wrong or preaching wrong because that's the position that I'm in. But you've got to study it out yourself. So he lied to the people. The people had that much trust in him. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, well, why were they not, not smart enough to think? I mean, they're golden cats. They just went through King Solomon and realized that he was a wicked king. Why didn't they think about it? Why didn't they, they realize that idolatry and idolatry, why didn't they see the rain that went through? Why didn't they? Because they believed the person put before them. Very sad. Very, very, very sad day when we believe everything we hear and don't study that ourselves. So as I got studying this, I was just torn. I was sick this week. and and uh, So I have a lot of time when I'm sick to just stop. I can't clean the house, sweep them off the floors and scrub the floors and go take care of the chickens and, and take care. I can't do none of that because if I don't feel good, I... And uh, I, I had a stomach problem this week, so I was in the bed and studying, read, thinking. I go to my computer in, in the study there, and I read and pray a little while, and I get to feeling yucky, so I go lay down in the bed for a little while. And then I go back, and I come. The whole time, my mom's thinking about it. I go make me a glass of water, and I'm thinking about it. So I have had time this week to dig out all this and think about how You've got to be ever so careful, and God's mercy only goes so long. His judgment, yes, he's got mercy. He's full of mercy. But his judgment is just as just as big as his mercy. He is he is a judge, he is a jealous God. Why we learned last week that he said, Have no other gods before me. Right, come on. So he built two golden calves. He placed them in convenient places and to worship. He told them it was too far to go to Jerusalem, so just to worship the golden calves instead. One sin led to another sin, and Jeroboam had built a house of idols to worship and installed priests to order the rituals. Right, you're right. Right there close to town. Lord help Jesus. So then that's where we're getting into the scripture where it talked about the man of God. The man of God. It, it was um, funny to me that the scripture says, and behold there came a man of God. And behold there came a man of God. He never gave his name. He never told us what his name was. It just referred to him as the man of God. <coughs> and I told Pastor, I said, why did they ever give us his name? 
For some reason it just said, Behold the man of God. Behold the man of God. I'm telling you, if this happened to me, it might wake me up, but apparently it didn't wake them up. So we're getting into the scripture where it says, Behold the man of God. So they installed this place to worship and had the priest there. He proclaimed a feast and offered sacrifices of incense to the adulterous altar while the ceremony was going on. The prophet of God, the man of God that the scripture talks about, showed up with the word from the Lord. Jeroboam was standing in the, by the false altar when the man of God began to proclaim. So this is the story. I want y'all to understand. So while Jeroboam is at the altar and he's burning the incense and he's doing this adulterous thing, this man of God shows up and he starts proclaiming against Jeroboam. That's where the scripture says, Behold the man of God says. So he starts proclaiming against him and he says to him, He declared a boy would be born in the line of David named jo 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 Josiah, Josiah who would become the king. We read that in, in our scripture text. And then he said, as the king, he would destroy this idolatrous worship. Well, he's saying it over top of them while they're doing this. He would offer a uh, the priest upon their own altar and burn their bones there. Then he said, he also declared that God was going to give a sign to prove the truth of this prophecy. He said the altar would be broken apart right before the eyes of, of them and the ashes would be poured out. While they're doing this, he's telling them. This is what we were reading in scripture that was kind of, that I said didn't probably make sense because we were getting there in the middle of it. Of course, Jeroboam was furious because while he's sacrificing his wonderful, supposable sacrifice toward his idolatrous, you know, pagan or whatever, God, this man of God comes in and he wrecks his party. Come on. Yeah. Per se. He tears up his party and he starts prophesying over him the man of God who does not have a name in the scripture. Never gives his name. It's interesting how he became so angry when God sends a message condemning their waywardness and sin. So he starts getting mad at the man of God because he just wrecked their little feast and party that they had. But instead, I was thinking, well, I would be thinking, well, it's mercy and grace and, and honor that he, you know, bestowed upon him and was thankful that he gave that to him and told him, you know, I was there for you and I, you know, giving you an extra... Uh, you know, time to turn your life over to the Lord. No, he just got mad. So what did the scripture say he did? Come on. Uh, verse 4 said, And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the sayings of the man of God, which had cried after the altar of Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him, and his, and his hand, which was put forth, dried up, so that he could not pull it away from him. So he got mad because verse 2 said that he cried out and he told them that, you know, all these things were going to happen. So he got mad and he told his people, Take hold on him. Get a hold of that man of God. Do something with him. Get him out of here. Get him out of the house. Get him out of here. I don't want him talking about all this. I'm trying to sacrifice, you know, and, and burn incense to, to this adult and, you know, and all this. I'm trying to do something here. Come on, sister. So he shouted to his royal kings to seize the prophet and lifted his hand towards him to strike him. But as soon as he stretched forth his hand toward the man of God, it withered. And he could not pull back while he stood there. His hand and arm was paralyzed. 
Just as that happened, do you remember what the prophet said? He said that when that it would, he prophesied that when, if it was true, what would happen? What did he say was going to happen to the altar? He said it was going to burst. And it was going to, okay, so just as he stretched forth his hand to grab the man of God, the altar burst open and poured out, and the man of God declared that everything burst. Just as he went to grab the man of God, his arm was paralyzed. Well, Jeroboam realized that the man of God was truly a man of God. He began to plead to restore his withered hand. Does that not surprise us that just when we get right stuck in the middle of being in the fire of sin, that that's when we cry out, okay, I believe you. Now you're the man of God. Right, come on, that's now right. You're right. Now, okay, now please have mercy. So he said, please, man of God. And I was shocked because I thought, I'm surprised he even he even had mercy on it. You know, when I'm reading the whole story, and I'm, I'm consumed by the story, you know. So he begged him, Jeroboam begged him and said, please, man of God, which still does not have a name. Please, man of God, please would you restore my hand. So, it said the prophet cried out to God and Jeroboam's hand was fully restored and healed. Right, Immediately. So then Jeroboam's attitude changed toward the man of God now and he divided him back to his palace for refreshments and a reward as well. To thank him, of course, for what he had done. But however, this is where, this is exactly where we learn here. Because our whole lesson is about a disobedient prophet. It wasn't about Jeroboam. It was about the man of God that has no name in Scripture. It says, however, the man of God had been instructed by God that he would not was not to eat or drink nothing on his journey. He was also told to return a, a different route home and not to travel the same way. So he went one way to get to, to, to Jeroboam. He was told, do not eat, do not drink anything your whole journey. This is where the problem came in. So he told Jeroboam, I'm not, I'm not getting anything from you. I'm not eating, I'm not drinking. Whatever your reward is, I don't want it. I don't want to go back to your palace. I don't want anything you have. I was instructed to go home. Right, come on. So the Bible says that he did just that. He went a different way home. He, on his travel home, he stopped under an oak tree to rest. He's resting under the oak tree, relaxing, and another man comes up and says, I'm a man of God, and God told me to tell you that he knows you're tired, come eat and drink. This is where it comes in. This is where I went to the pastor and said, I don't understand. Explain to me. He said, come eat and drink. God told me to tell you. I'm a prophet of God. God told me to tell you to come eat and drink because I know you're tired. And God knows you're tired, so come eat and drink. Right. Oh, okay. So he got up, got his stuff, right. and went to the palace, to the place, to the other man of God that claimed to be a man of God to eat and drink. And God spoke to him and said, you will not go home without being without dying. You disobeyed me. On his way home, he died. He got ate by a lion on his way home. You know why? Because he was disobedient. So my whole lesson, I want to explain to you something. Just like I started out in the beginning and I had said, we may start out, well, people of God must be careful to obey Him fully. Even those who have been God's spokesmen will suffer the consequence of disobedience. We may start out well, but we fall by the wayside because we don't continue to listen to God 
and do exactly what he tells us to do all the way to the end. I've heard many people say, oh, but God will understand. He understands that, you know, and yes, he is merciful. I said that in the beginning. I justified that in the beginning and said, I know he's a merciful God, and there is things he understands. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm not here to say that God's all judgment and that you're, you know, everybody's going to be judged and it, he doesn't understand. I'm not saying that. But our whole lesson is about a disobedient prophet in, in Kings here, and we're talking about how he started out well and he followed out completely out exactly what God told him to do, but he didn't go all the way home without eating. And when I went to pastor and I said, I don't understand, I said, what did it matter? I mean, what's the big deal when he ate right before he got home? He said, you're missing the point. God told him not to, and he disobeyed him. So I sat there, and I thought about it, and fear started to rise up in me, and I thought, I have to think about that a lot of times I always teach and preach about the mercy of God, and I forget to teach and preach that He still is our judge. And we still disobey Him, and He still is going to be judge us one day, and we still don't listen a lot of times. And we don't follow through with the whole with the whole decision that you're the whole plan of God. So being disobedient, we may start out well, and we may have our total mindset on doing exactly what we're supposed to do, but not follow through with it because we fell by the wayside at the end. And I got to thinking about fasting. A lot of times we start well in fasting. We start real well. We tell everybody, I'm going to fast for whatever day. I'm going to fast and we... I mean, we're on fire to fast. Right, come on. We That's get right. going and Amen. we start off and, you know, we... No, no thank you. No, I, I can't go out today. I'm, 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 no thank you. You don't tell them why. No, no thank you. No. Thank you, though. Are you fasting? Bless you, sister. You, know, you don't want to tell nobody because you want to start out well. But boy, when you get towards the end of it, drywall starts smelling good to eat. Amen. Yeah, right. Come on. A book starts smelling good to eat. I mean, anything starts smelling good. Amen. Stuff that you would never eat. People say, could you, you know, could you, you know, they ask me, I'm petrified of, of snakes, and they say, could you ever eat a snake? I said, I think if I was hungry enough, I could. I went on enough fast that I think if you cooked it up when I was fasting, I could eat it. Because that's desperate. Yeah, it is. Right, right. You know, when you are desperate, how desperate are we to know the will of God and to follow through and to not be obedient? When we are disobedient and we start out well, He knows we're starting out well and He knows our heart and He knows our desire. But He knew the man of God was able to continue and He knew already that He was not going to obey Him. He already knew. Sister Myers, one of the biggest problems that we run into in this generation that I personally see is there is just an incredible amount of excuse for sin. And uh, a lot of times the way that people have viewed it and they've been taught is in such a way that, that you can live any way you want and all sin, all sin is just excused away and and washed away in such a way that it doesn't make any it doesn't make any difference. You can live any way you want to. Well Christ the blood of Jesus Christ justifies us through repentance. But repentance isn't a willful act of turning away on our own behalf. And the problem that you see is that, that it's been taught and it's been lived in such a way that it look, we look to God as if no matter what we do, it's okay. He understands. He's going to overlook it. But when you look at Scripture, that wasn't the purpose of the death of Jesus Christ was to allow us to live any kind of way. The Bible said the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly in this present world, righteously. And the problem is, is that people look at grace as just a like a chemical agent in the process of salvation, that grace just washes, grace just forgives. 
But grace also, God's grace also teaches us how to live and that we not continue anymore therein in that path of sinfulness. So rather than continuing to make excuse for and justifying our uh, ungodliness and our sinfulness, uh, we have to reflect sometimes back on Scripture to be able to take a, a look at some of the events that took place in Scripture. For example, in the Old Testament, like you and I were talking the other night, where that they were told to go in and eradicate, to kill everything, destroy everything, and don't take any of the possessions. But then they destroyed most everything, but they kept a few things back for themselves. And, you know, later on the man of God comes along and he says, what meaneth this lowing of the sheep and the bowing of the oxen or something to that effect? In other words, God knew that they did not completely follow through with everything that God wanted them to do. There was a, there was a level of disobedience and God acted on that uh, then you look at the New Testament. Some people say, well, Brother Myers, that's the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? In the New Testament, you've got Ananias and Sapphira who, don't, who do not completely follow through with the will of God by keeping back a portion of the, the, uh, the giving of tithes or what have you, uh, the percentage or whatever that they were to bring. And so but here they stand in front of the man of God and God drops them dead right in front of everybody. And people say, well, no matter what you do, God's just going to overlook it and this kind of thing. There's also a passage in the New Testament that talks about how much more sore punishment suppose ye the blood of Jesus being trampled on whenever you look back at the, the Old Testament, people look at it as if somehow or another that the New Testament ushers in an era, a new generation, where you can just live any way you want to. It's a free-for-all. But that's not exactly... That's not altogether the truth. I believe it's a balance of mercy, a balance of obedience, repentance, which is a turning away from sin. It's not just a asking God forgiveness, but it's a turning away. So people need to understand this because on that day, we're going to stand before Him. He's going to say, He's either going to say, well done, or you're not, well, not well done. It's either you fought a good fight, finished your race, what have you, or you didn't. One of the two. There's no, uh, you did pretty good, enter in, half-hearted servant. It was nothing like that. That's, that's Scripture. So people can preach it and teach it any way they want to. But I'd rather get to heaven as the old saying and have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Amen. Amen. That's the truth. We, we have this, to remember the Old Testament is still there. Yeah. It shows that the Old Testament is from Genesis. Sister Myers, one more thing I wanted to mention. I
reports now the Ten Commandments is carried up the Old Testament was different. Even in the marriage situation. You never hear nobody preach on that. But you know, when they when they marry, they marry in the generation. Real quick, Sister Myers, one of the things I think you and I have mentioned, I was explaining to you the other night when we were talking, um, there's a story in the scripture that talked about a Rechabite people. Did you mention that? And I missed it. Uh, well, if you go back and you look at Jeremiah the prophet, Sister uh, Wilma mentioned Jeremiah, but Jeremiah was considered one of the greatest prophets yeah. of the Old Testament. And a lot of people respect his everything about Jeremiah, and so did many in that day as well. There's always going to be people that don't agree, but he, he had respect and clout with a lot of different people. Even still, there was a tribe of people called the Rechabite people, and the Rechabite people, there came a, they had made a covenant. They were not direct descendants of God's people, but they were, uh, in a sense, they were uh, grafted in because of their agreement and covenant to worship God and what have you. And so that they made commitments and covenants to God, Jehovah. And they said, one of those commitments was, we will drink no fruit of the vine. That was one of their commitments. And there came a time when God used Jeremiah to test the Rechabite people. And the Bible said He laid pots full of wine out in front of them and said, now drink you the wine. And the Rechabite people said, no, our father Rechab, Basically, they said, our father Rechab made a commitment that we would drink no wine, so we will have none. And you know, that is so powerful. That, that to me is a lot like the fact that you look at uh, Joseph who left his coat in the hand of Potiphar's wife. You think about the fact that Joseph left his coat in the hand of Potiphar's wife and you think about the Rechabite people. These were two different people that weren't even baptized in the Holy Ghost, yet we got people today that have no self-control and claim to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's a whole other message. But it's really, really powerful to me to know that there were some people that followed through with their commitment and they were rewarded for that commitment. We will be rewarded at the end if we're not disobedient. And I was going to get to that. Well, I'm going to read my illustration to the end. Um, it says, A young son of a missionary couple was playing in the yard. Suddenly the voice of the boy's father rang out from the porch. Philip, obey me instantly. Drop to your stomach. Immediately the youngster did as his father commanded. Now crawl towards me as fast as you can. The boy obeyed. Stand up and run to me. Philip responded unquestionably and ran to his father's arms. As the, boy, as the youngster turned to look at the tree by which he had been playing, he saw a large deadly snake hanging from one of the branches. His instant obedience without questioning saved his life. And of course that's just an illustration, but a lot of times our instant obedience saves us from things. And we pray, we pray, we should pray constantly. And we're praying for, for constant things. I pray, I have constant things I pray for. Um, our church, our church people, you know, their needs, you know, their constant needs that's on their heart, you know. And if I am instant in prayer, sometimes in the middle of the night, the other night, I woke up the last Sunday morning early. I don't sleep Saturday nights normally. It's, it's just um, not giving the devil any credit. It's just one of the things I fight to teach Sunday school. There's several things I fight. That's one thing. I don't get to sleep on Saturday night. I, I just don't. I just wore all night long fighting the enemy all night Saturday night. And I just take it with joy. I don't, I'm not angry. I take it with joy. I tell him, you know what? I don't care if I don't sleep all night Saturday night. I'm still going to get up and teach Sunday school. You ain't going to keep me from teaching. I don't care. I'm still teaching, and when I get home on Sunday afternoon, I'm going to take a nap. Amen. And guess what? I sleep real good on Sunday afternoon, so praise the Lord. But anyway, while I'm up on Saturday night, I had just dozed off in a deep sleep, and the Lord woke me up to pray for Jackson's grandson, Michael, last Sunday night. Or Saturday night. 
And so I did. I got up and prayed for him and uh, went back and went back to bed. Well, she came in Sunday morning and she was telling me that he was sick with the virus. And I said, well, the Lord woke me up last night and I prayed for him. And she started to cry and I said, she said, thank you. I said, don't thank me. I'm just letting you know that the Lord already knew. It's, it's a confirmation to you. It's not thankfulness to me. It's a confirmation to you that the Lord already knows. All right, yeah. And He's Come already on. aware yeah. that He's got people thank the praying Lord. And, and lifting Him up already before you even came to service. He was already on my mind in the middle of the night. I was praying for Him. Well, I thank God he's coming home today. Well, praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Six weeks to go tomorrow. Six weeks. And he can't go anywhere for a year except he's going to take back for the God. Having to take 20 different things. Bless him, Lord. Praise the Lord. And now, see, now you know what a 16 year old grandson had, had cancer. We're believing the Lord healed him. It's all the Lord. It's all the Lord. We're just the servants. We're just obedient. See what disobedience sometimes is just prayer, but oh, it goes a long way. When you take somebody's need just like it's your own, I took that need like it was my grandbaby. I only got one, and I think she's just the best thing walking because, you know, she's my grandbaby. And, you know, just like you think yours is, and if you don't, there's a problem, you know, because your grandbaby should be the best thing, you know. And I only have one, so I can spoil one, and my love can only be filtered to one. If I had a million, I'd feel the same way. But, um, Lord help us. But that's not. Lord help us. We really got the money now, we wouldn't have the money then. But, um, you know, I take that need like it's mine. You know why? Because that's the way we're supposed to. That infirmity or that problem should be mine. Because that's my sister in the Lord. I look up to her. I'm supposed to look up to her. I'm supposed to look up to the older women. Because that's where I learn. I tell her all the time, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. Still serving the Lord. Still worshiping the Lord. Still seeking the Lord. Right. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Right. Yes. Amen. Tell it. Because she doesn't falter from that. Nope. Sister Wilma doesn't falter from nope. that. They come in here. She's been sick this year. She's had hip surgery, knee surgery, whatever. She still comes in. I've seen her barely wobble in here, but she still comes. She still gets up on Sunday morning. Sister Benefield's had cancer, still come in. But you know what? That's what we learn from. That's what we're supposed to learn from. Disobedience is going to get us in the place we don't want to be in. What happened to the prophet that was disobedient? He was killed immediately for his disobedience. Let's not do that. Let's learn from the morning of today to not be disobedient. All right. Please turn in the service over. Please. I still want everybody to Oh, yes. Yes, ma'am. Praise the Lord. I mean, it's glad to be saved this morning. Amen. We're going to have a few minutes of transition so our singers, musicians, and different ones can get up on the platform, get ready to sing. Give you a minute. We can fellowship a little bit. Uh, shake a few hands. Make everybody welcome this morning. And uh, use the restroom. Go to the bathroom. Change the baby's diaper or whatever you got to do. So there's no hindrance this morning to worship the Lord. Thank you.